Roger Sternberg. I'd like to welcome you to the Somerset Presbyterian Church on this Labor Day weekend. It's also the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Please check out our announcements and the prayer list in the, in the bulletin and on the SPC website. This morning Mary Jane is not here, so we're going to have to do the music a, a cappella, so we'll really see how well you can sing. Let us worship God. First, let us pray. O oh Lord, you are the potter, we are the clay. Take our lives, O oh God, and remake us anew. Pour out your Spirit upon us, that we may be filled with living water. Fit us for your purposes, that we may be wholly yours. Amen. All who are able, please stand and join us in, our, in, in the call to worship. When we try to hide, God always finds us. When we crawl into the darkness, even though we don't escape God's eyes. Are you tired of running from the one who loves you? We are here at last. Let us worship the living God. Please remain standing. We'll sing hymn number 267, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Things bright and beautiful, creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, God made their glowing. Colors. God made their tiny things. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wild and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The purple-headed mountain the river running by, the sunset and the morning that brightens up the sky. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruits in the garden, the Lord them every one. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. God 
gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell how great is God Almighty who has made all things well all things bright and beautiful all creatures great and small all things wise and wonderful the Lord God made them all. Thank you so much. You may be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Holy God, God, we have sought, sought to follow you without counting the cost, cost, but our tanks are running empty, and we are afraid we can't go the distance. We are hidden in the crowd, ignoring Christ's call to pick up our cross and follow him. We have hidden in the stories we tell ourselves that we will attend our spiritual work someday, just not this day. Please forgive us and help us assess our motives and intentions, even as we ponder our need for the journey. For only then will we know if we have what it takes to finish the course in faith. Amen. Please bow your heads and join me in, in a period of silent reflection. Amen. When we fall short in life, God's puts us on the potter's wheel and fashions us into vessels fit for the kingdom. The journey of transformation is rarely pleasant, but it is necessary for us to be made new and whole. Please stand and join me in singing praises to God for the gift of grace, the Gloria Patri, hymn number 579. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, it's now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Christ be with you. And also with you. Christ calls us into service with him, but warns us to count the cost before we put our shoulder to the plow. Though the cost may seem high, the cost of trying to go it alone is higher still. There is peace and ease in Christ's yoke. Let us share this peace with one another with a parade wave. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? When we try to hide, Lord, you can always find us. Even when we crawl into the darkness, we cannot escape your eyes. We are tired of running, Lord, and we are here at last. Share your teachings of life and death, for you love us as your people, and we love you as our God. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 5 and 12 through 17. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar, and you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. And you hem in behind me and before me and you lay your hand upon me. Even the darkness, even the darkness will not be dark to you. 
The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body while the days ordained for me were written in your book, before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 33. It's the cost of being a disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, brother and sister, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my but disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. And in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. So if you've seen this demonstration before, then don't say anything, but if you haven't, then answer. Is this fault? What do you think? Do you think this is fault? Yes. Okay. okay. Now, as you can see, as I shake it, there was still room in there. And the sand filled up all them little empty spaces, even though it seemed like it was full. Now is it full? Yes. 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 But. It's still bubbling through all of those pieces. Now it's really full. So I want you to recognize, and this was a demo, an online story that I had seen. I want you to recognize that this jar right there represents your life. And the balls that I put in first are the important things in your life. You're like your faith and your family and your children, your health and your friends and your favorite passions. Things that if everything else was lost, 
and only they remained, your life would still be full. And the glass beads are the other things that matter, like your job, your house, your car. And the sand is everything else, the small stuff. And if you put the sand into the jar first, then there wouldn't be any room for the glass beads, or there wouldn't be any room for the balls. And the same goes for life. If you spend all your time and your energy on the small stuff, you will never have room for the things that are important to you. So pay attention to the things that are critical to your happiness. Play with your children. Take time to get medical checkups. Take your partner out to dinner. There'll be always time to clean your house and do all the other stuff. Take care of the balls first. The things that really matter. Set your priorities. The rest is just hand. And I told you this story during my sermon entitled Stewardship of Time on November 1st. But this time I actually demonstrated and changed it up a little bit from the actual story. It was a story about a professor who did this demonstration in front of a classroom. And I bring it up again because in Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells us to consider the cost of becoming a disciple. And one of those costs is our time. And in fact, time is a huge component of discipleship. Jesus is very transparent, transparent. he's very upfront about the pluses and minuses of discipleship. If we're going to go into this endeavor, we have to go in with a very clear understanding of what we're getting ourselves into, and he did that with his disciples. Being a disciple of Jesus is not for the faint of heart, he says. John 15, chapter, 20, ch chapter 15, verses 20 through 21 tells us, For if they, are, they persecuted Jesus, they're going to persecute us, his disciples, too. And hard times may come upon us because people don't like what we have to say or what we represent. But the rewards in this life are not only rest for the weary, as it says in Matthew's Gospel, but peace which surpasses all understanding, the Apostle tell, and Paul tells us, and joy despite trying circumstances. Now that's what happens in this lifetime. And then there are other worldly rewards, like everlasting life, John 3.16 tells us. There's an imperishable crown, a crown of glory, a crown of righteousness, a crown of rejoicing, and a crown of life. And while we may obtain the basic entrance into the kingdom, through grace, the rest of the rewards come from our work here on earth. Like everything else, there is always a cost. And there are only 24 hours in a day, and we have to make a decision every day where we spend our time. And that is why Jesus uses the analogy about projects. Before we begin a project, we need to evaluate our resources and our desire to get the project done. And if we don't have enough time or money or energy to get the project done, then we shouldn't even start it. And even if we do have enough of these, but we don't want to sacrifice any of them because we want to use them else there, then we shouldn't start. But once we do have the desire and the resources, and then we begin the project, it needs to be done in steps. So for example, when I was having a new roof put on, I hired someone who knew how to do the work. And then they gathered the materials, and then they took off the old roof, and they repaired the rotted wood, and they laid down a layer of protective sheeting, and then they put on a top layer of roofing shingles. Now let's put those steps into spiritual terms. First, you would find a Christian mentor who has a deep understanding of the spiritual life. Both of you would pray for guidance from the Holy Spirit. Your mentor would talk to you to find out where you are on your spiritual journey and gather information to give to you to help you with your relationship with Jesus. They would pray for you on a regular basis and teach you to pray, which is your first line of defense against any storms in this life. So that's like the protective sheeting. And next, they would help you find a healthy church home where you would be supported, protected, and taught the faith. So that's like the top layer. And if these, all of these things take time. True discipleship is a commitment of time and a shifting of our priorities, the priorities that we had before, 
and now the priorities that we have now. And I had to do that too. There are things that you think were important, and they may be very worthwhile things, but if you want to grow spiritually, sometimes you have to give up some of these other worthwhile things to spend time to grow in your faith. And think about how you spend your time. How much of that time is in prayer? And when I say prayer, I don't mean the perfunctory, memorized prayer or the wish list, Jesus, help, I want this, I want that. How much of it is a genuine conversation with Jesus? I read a book by Brother Lawrence who said that he talked to Jesus all day long. He would talk to him as he's washing the dishes, as he was tidying up. He was a monk, and, and so they worked in the gardens, and they did all different types of things around the monastery. And no matter what he was doing, he would talk to Jesus about it. He would thank him when something went well, and that's the kind of conversation that you would have all day. Because I don't know about you, if I tried to do it at the end of the day, I would fall asleep. As I was praying, I'd be laying there praying, and then out I went. And it's a common thing most people do. I don't know about you, but I'm not a morning person. So some people get up early and they, they pray. Um, and I will try and pray, but you know, you've got, you're, you've got to be somewhere or you've got to do something. So that, that continual conversation, you don't have to try and remember at the end of the day um, to, to what you wanted to ask or what you wanted to pray about. So as the day goes by, I just ask Jesus or I talk to him about it. So these are, these are good ways of keeping a spiritual conversation going and, and your spiritual life growing. Friends, we are only on this earth for a relatively short time when you consider eternity. And so how much of our time is spent on our faith family, our sisters and brothers in Christ, and how much of it is preparing for eternity? In the passage from Luke, Jesus is not talking about us hating our, our relatives, our blood relatives. He's acknowledging that sometimes our blood relatives hinder our spiritual progress or are in direct opposition to it when you become a follower of Jesus. And for example, um, St. Francis of Assisi, he was born in 1182 and he died 1226 AD. And he was born into a world wealthy merchant family. And one day he was praying in a dilapidated old church. And he heard a voice telling him to rebuild the church. Now before that he lived a pretty um, a life of a young person out having a good time and partying. But at that point he, was, he heard this voice. And so he, he took that to mean repair that church. And so he took some clothes from his father's store and he sold it. And he tried to give money to the priest to repair the church, but the priest wouldn't take the money. And so his father found out what he had did, and he was furious. And, and so he, Francis found out his father was furious, and he hid in a cave for several weeks. And then what happened was, when he came into town, because he was dirty and he was hungry, his father, his furious father, beat him, bound him, and locked him into a small storeroom. Now, while his father was away, his mother released him, and then later on, Francis's father, his father got the money back, okay, so everything was, he got exactly, he didn't really lose anything. But his father was so incensed about all of this that he decided he wanted Francis to recant his inheritance. And so Francis said, okay, I will do that. And he went to the town and he recanted. But, but not only did he renounce his inheritance, because his father said this was restitution for, for whatever happened, Francis not only did that, but he took it one step further. He, he gave, gave him the clothes off his back. Now, as the story goes, it is said that the local bishop gave Francis um, a robe to cover him up. So Fr Francis may be in a little bit extreme, but he wanted to prove a point that he was going into, the, he was not going to let anything hinder him from his faith. And so by later on, Francis, he lived a life of poverty. And little by little, he gained a following, and he founded the um, the Franciscan Order, which was the, the, it was named after him. And they were called a mendicant order, which means they take a, a vow of poverty. And so, what they did was they took Matthew's Gospel, the, the chapter ten verses five through fifteen, seriously. When Jesus sent the twelve out to preach, and he said, "Only take the clothes on their back," and that's what they did. They only had the clothes on their back and they relied on people to give to them and they were, they were self-sufficient. 
And so, for Jesus, the work of the kingdom was the top priority, and he expected it to be a top priority of the disciples too, and that's what Francis um, took it as. In our passage from Luke, Jesus is talking about us consistently, consistently not allowing something less spiritually valuable to take up the time of something more spiritually valuable. Now, Francis didn't want the trappings of this world to interfere with his ministry, and many of us do not have to go to such extremes as Francis, but Jesus is clear that we should not let anything or anyone get in the way of our relationship with God. God has a different plan for each and every one of us. God may not want us to live like Francis. God may have us want us to reach a different, a different group of people and have us do different things. So we don't necessarily have to follow Francis's example in that, to that extreme, but you need to be in contact with God and talking to God to find out what that is. Friends, we need to surround ourselves with people that will support us in our faith work, and that's what Francis did. People saw the good work that Francis did, helping the poor, rebuilding the churches, because he did go around and rebuild a lot of churches. And so they wanted to get, get in on his ministry, and they joined his order. And that's how it happened. They saw what he did, and they wanted to join. So earlier in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, Jesus said that his true family were not relatives that shared the same blood, but those that hear God's word and do it. And the Apostle Paul further discusses the new household of faith in Ephesians, chapter 2. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done for us. So you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people, meaning the Israelites. You are members of God's family. And together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. And then in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone especially to those in the family of faith. So we are not only all one in the spirit, we are told to go out and do good to all. In essence, we are to love our neighbor, as we've been talking about. But the caveat is that we are to be especially good to other believers. Now the problem with this is that we bring baggage from our biological families, our blood relatives, which many times hinder, hinders us from being remade in Christ's image. In our lectionary reading, which I didn't read today, you're usually given a bunch of different choices, and that um, came, this one was from Jeremiah. But in that particular reading, God told him to go to the potter's house where the potter was working at a wheel. And the jar that he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. And then the Lord gave him this message to say, O oh Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands. So friends, we are the clay in the potter's hands. When we join the household of faith, we ask God to take our lives and to daily remake us new. But this act must be, a, we must be a willing participant. We must empty ourselves and be filled by God's Holy Spirit. And then we will be sustained and as one commentary put it, by the invincible love of God and Jesus Christ. Because sometimes we're not loving, let's put it mildly, but sometimes we all have bad days, we all have stuff we're bringing around with us, and it's God's love coming through us that we are able to love our neighbors. And sometimes other people aren't loving either, and so it's hard to love them. But when we have the Holy Spirit in us, then we are able to love others, and they are able to love us. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, it says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And as the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God love, God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God 
that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there are an array of things to overcome in this earthly and spiritual realm, says Ephesians chapter 6. For the battle is already in progress. And Jesus wants us to know right from the start that it will cost us everything. Yes, he also tells us that his victory has been secured through his work on the cross. He has overcome death and has prepared a place for us in his heavenly kingdom. And in John chapter 14, verse 2, he says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have not told you I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will be with me always. Friends, we who believe have a place in heaven with Jesus for all eternity. And we are only here temporarily. Some people worry about little children's places in heaven. But Jesus told us that the kingdom of heaven belongs to them in Matthew chapter 19. In the gospel we are told that then the children were being brought to Jesus in order that he may lay his hands upon them and pray. And the disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them. But Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not stop them. For such as these, the kingdom of heaven belongs. And he laid his hands on them and he went on his way. Yes, friends, heaven and rewards await us. But while we are here, there is work to do. And I just want to say, because I had said it in the children's message, I talked a little bit about death and heaven because of what had happened recently with the toddler in passing. And so, since we didn't do the children's message today, I want to speak to that a little bit before I close the sermon up. But we are here on a temporary basis. Our, play, our permanent home is in heaven. This is just a place where we learn and grow and, and learn to more about God and grow in God's grace and truth. And so some of, us, some of us are here for a short period of time, some of us are here for a long period of time, but ultimately our home is in heaven. And so when we leave this place, that's where we go. And so the passages I read to you today talk about that, and especially the passage I read to you from Psalm. God knows us from our very beginning. And there was a, a story about a, a little child who had, a, who had a baby brother and sister, and they wanted to go into the room where the little baby and brother and sister were and talk to them privately. And the mother was a little concerned because you never know if the children get jealous or not. But the mother said, okay, and she let the child go in there. The child was about four or five, and the newborn was in there, you know, maybe about six months old. And the mother peeked in and... and and he was just asking the child, you know, what's God like? I've forgotten it. I'm starting to forget what God's like. And I thought that story was so cute because when you're, when you're in, you know, when you're in the womb and when you're young, you, you automatically already know God. You've, you've had that, that feeling of God. And as we grow into the world, we learn about the world, we kind of lose touch with the spirit. And we need to grow back into that. And so that's my understanding. That may not be the PCUSA's um, understanding of it. But I thought that was a, a good way to, to think about things um, to, when given the circumstances of what was going on. And so our, our place here on earth is temporary. We are here to learn to love God and to grow closer to God. And then God will take us into his arms and bring us to where a place where there is where there's joy and there's peace and there's no more tears. So heaven and its rewards wait for us, but while we're here, there's work to do. And if we want that close relationship with Jesus, then we need to work on it. We need to put time into it and we need to make it a top priority. True deep discipleship is a commitment of time, a shifting priorities to make time for God and to, for Jesus. And that's why priorities are so important. And that's why we need to keep our eye on Jesus so that we will be focused on him and the work of the kingdom. And that is one of those things that will be one of the big walls that we put in our prior, our jar of life as a priority. Amen. Consecrated, Lord, to 
traditional to do the Nicene Creed is our affirmation of faith. So will you all please join me in reciting our, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. The words of Paul spoken long ago can be spoken here today. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers because I've heard of your love, both for the Lord Jesus and for all of God's people. What this ancient church was doing long ago, we are doing today, whenever we uphold the work of Jesus Christ in the world. Let us give joyfully to this work out of the same spirit of love that Paul blessed in the ancient church. And so, friends, there are four ways to send in your offering. You can send it in through regular mail, you can drop it in at the church office, or you can make a donation through PayPal on our church website, or you can place it in the offering plate in the narthex on your way out. All who are able, please stand and join me in the doxology, hymn number 592. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lovely ladies, let us pray. Loving Potter, you are ever mindful of your people. You fashion us into vessels fit for your service and transform our gifts and offerings into vessels to serve your, your world. You are worthy of our praise and glory. Amen. Please be seated. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees when I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun oh Lord have mercy on me let us drink wine together on our knees let us drink wine 
to cue you a few sentences before the people's part with the word therefore and this gesture. There will be another sentence and then I will further cue you when it's your part with the words and the people say. And then it's your turn to say the people's part print in the bulletin, which in one section says the words holy, holy, holy Lord. And then later I will cue you again for your part in a similar manner. And that changes um, from week, from month to month. And for those of you who are at home, if you haven't already done so, it's best for you to gather your communion elements now, which would be bread or crackers or juice and, and juice and water. And for those of you who are partaking in church, please take the time now to open the... Does everybody have one of these, first of all? If not, there are some in the back of the narthex on the table uh, over by Terry. Okay. So um, take the time now to open the little bit. Uh, first, there's a clear section. So pull that back just a tiny bit so you can get at it. Um, when it's time on it for the wafer section, you pull the clear one. Then when it's time to do the juice section, you are going to pull the um, other section where the uh, foil is. Don't pull that one too much, otherwise the juice might spill. But it's also like a little flap, so you can at least start the flap to make it a little easier for later because it does tend to be a little tricky sometimes, okay? So if you want to get that prepared now, that would be a good thing. All right, we are all going to be partaking together with the bread and then with the cup, so I will let you know when it's time to open the wafer and then when it's time to open the juice section. Okay, and I think that should take care of it. Everybody does have, please raise your hand if you don't have one of these. I just want to make sure we're all set. Okay, great. Friends, this is the joyous feast of the people of God, and they will come from east and west and north and south to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. And according to Luke, our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table, and our Savior invites those who trust in him to share in the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall endure. You are always the same, and your years will never end. You made us in your image and called us to be your people. But we turn from you, leaving sin and death to reign. And still you loved us and sought us. And in Christ, your grave defeated death and opened the way to eternal life. Therefore, we lift our hearts in joyful praise, join our voices with the choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. And the people say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God, mm, God, God, heaven and earth, holy glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. We praise you, most holy God, for sending your only Son to live among us, sharing our joy and sorrow. He told your story, healing the sick, and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took his cross and died that we might live. And we praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. Who is still the friend of sinners, we trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we break this bread and share one cup, giving thanks for your saving love in Jesus Christ. You raised our Lord from death and call us with him from death to life. And we give ourselves to you to live for him in joy and grateful praise. Great is the mystery of faith, and the people say, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. 
Send us out in power of the Spirit to live for others as Christ lived for us, announcing his death for the sins of the world and telling his, of his resurrection to all the people and nations. And by your Spirit, draw us all together in one body and join us to Christ the Lord, that we may remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. Remembering your church, united in truth of your word and empower it in ministry to the world. Remembering the nations, by your spirit, renew the face of the earth and let peace and justice prevail. Remember our families and friends and bless them and watch over them. Be gracious to them and give them peace. Remember the sick and the suffering and the aged and the dying. We especially lift up today Alex and David, Malachi, Locasio, Mike, Cleopatra, Anna, Robin, Henry, Pat, Agatha, Edmina, Jeanette, Cindy, Mildred, Mercedes, Mary Jane, Sam, Eric, George, the family of the two-year-old from Franklin who died on Tuesday. Encourage and give them hope and comfort them in their sorrow. Rejoicing in the communion of the saints, we remember with thanksgiving all your faithful servants and those dear to us whom you have called home from this life. We are grateful for them that death is no more, nor is there sorrow, crying, or pain. For the former things have passed away. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O God, that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all the saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, for and ever and ever. Amen. And may we all say the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take this and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time that you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until I come again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please, friends, please open the wafer section of your cup. Everybody ready? The body of Christ given for you. Now you may open your cups with the juice section. Everybody set? Okay. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. 
O oh God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills and our works, a continual thank offering to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us sing our communion hymn. so we couldn't even, actually, nobody was even here. I was doing this with nobody in the congregation, and then it was with, with masks on and no, no singing. So this is like the first time I've really heard your voices, and you are wonderful. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing you guys sing some more. But thank you so much to Hillary and to Charity for leading us today. And for Mary, we have prayers for Mary Jane, who wasn't feeling well. So, um, and we th want to thank James for filling in for the Hawks who are on vacation or away for the holiday weekend. So, um, we hope that you all have a wonderful holiday weekend and thank you for being here on this holiday weekend. Any first time visitors, um, we'd like you to sign our guest book um, so that we can, we usually just send a letter out with some information about the church and you know, we're not going to pester you, we're just going to contact you one other time with some more information. But if you would like to um, learn more right now, then just um, speak to me after church. I'll be here cleaning up a little bit and then in Fellowship Hall. Um, the person that's usually, uh, we haven't designated a person um, yet, but we will soon because of COVID, we're starting to lift some of the restrictions. And then following worship service, please join us in coffee hour in the Fellowship Hall. Our host today is John and Kathy Diley. And the coffee hour is in honor of their 52nd wedding anniversary. Let's have a round of applause for them. It's 
tough living with another person, as I know, because my husband and I are married many years, and, and to do it for 52 years and to still look as happy as they do and to be together that long is an accomplishment in today's society. So we are so grateful that you are here today and we're celebrating with you and that you chose to, to celebrate with us by doing the coffee hour. So congratulations and thank you for being here. And now, friends, the one, and we also have a benediction that we are still going to do a little different instead of me just doing it myself. You guys are going to participate in it, so I'm just prepping you for that one. And I'm going to start it off by the one who shaped us in our mother's womb loves and shapes us still. God is the Father, we are the clay. The one who formed us in our inward parts continues to create us anew each and every day. God is the Father, we are the clay. The one who molds us in God's own image fashions us for glory. God is the Father, we are the clay. Go with God's blessing, be at peace, and enjoy your holiday week, and God bless you all. What a beautiful name it is, the name. 